All right, we're looking at chapter four, which deals with stoichiometry, which is the art of balancing chemical equations. All right, uh, we're going to refresh our minds from what we learned in previous intro chemistry classes. Balancing of an equation is very straightforward in the sense that you want to have the same number of atoms on both sides of the balanced equation. Uh, both sides meaning products and reactants. Reactants are always on the left, products always on the right, and we want the same number of atoms. And you're going to fix that by adding coefficients. can never change the elemental makeup of the uh, uh, compounds or the ratios, because if we change those, we're changing the actual products and reactants. Um, your book does th show some things with like little pictures and such. Um, these can come in handy later on when we're talking about um, excess reagents or limiting reagents because in this case, if I had more of these little red marbles and pretend those are red and those are representing oxygen molecules, if I have extra, you're going to have extras left over because you can't add more oxygen just by adding, adding more oxygen. So that would change the chemistry. Uh, if the chemical reaction is known, your products and reactants are fixed on their uh, molecular structures. Okay, balancing a chemical equation is relatively straightforward. We typically go from left to right, and we just balance the atoms as we get to. Like on this one, if we looked at the N2 on the products and reactant side, we'd probably not do anything at first because both those have two nitrogens. But as soon as we get to the oxygen, we're going to see that having an even number of oxygens here will never give us those five, unless we were to do it with fractions, and we can't do that. So what we're going to do to take care of that fraction problem, we're just going to start by doubling this, which would actually make that an even number of oxygens. But that causes us to have to come back here and double the nitrogens. And then they get our oxygens right, we're going to add a five to it. And that's all we have to do to balance an equation. Now they're going to get more complex as we get in there, but typically that's what we do. We just move back and forth and uh, get it until we get all of their atoms balanced out. All right, a little bit more complex is something we introduced this starting now is we're going to give you the names and words and you have to figure out the chemical structures from those names and then actually do your balanced equation. All right, so I have ammonium nitrate. Ammonium is NH4 positive. Nitrate is NO3 minus. So ammonium nitrate is NH4 NO3. Since so it is a one-to-one -one relationship, I don't need to do any parentheses. All right, but decomposition of ammonium nitrate to form molecular nitrogen, which is just N2, and molecular oxygen, O2, and water. H2O. Now, if we were starting left or right here, I start out with two nitrogens, two nitrogens, four hydrogens, so I'd have to have two of these, which would give me one, two, three, four oxygens, but I only have three oxygens. So I'm going to back up, and when I back up, I'm going to actually double the amount of ammonium nitrates which would mean I need to come over here. That'll double the number of nitrogens because I've got two nitrogens in the ammonium nitrate. Two times two is four. Two times two is four. Uh, have eight hydrogens, so I need four waters. And now I have four oxygens, five, six oxygens, six oxygens. It's balanced like that. But we just went back and forth. About the only time I skip something is if I have an atom that's found in more than one product. Like, I would have probably on this problem not counted the oxygen until the very end because it's in two products. All right, how about another one? C2H6 and O2 and H2O and CO2. It's a standard combustion reaction of a hydrocarbon. I'm just rewriting it here so I can put coefficients in front of it easier. I didn't leave myself that on the slide. So I have two carbons, so I'm going to have two carbons. Six hydrogens. So I need to have three waters, but that's going to give me an odd number of oxygens on the product side. And I can't do that with this. So I'm going to double this, which means I need to come back here and double both those numbers. So it's not three waters, it's six waters, and it's not um, two carbon dioxides, it's four carbon dioxides. That gives me six oxygens plus another eight. I would need seven oxygen molecules. 
All right, now, technically, all the equations we just did would now be considered wrong in, organ in uh, Chem uh, in Chem 1 because technically I want to always list the physical states of our substances. Aqueous is when it's dissolved in water, but we always want to have those states. Like on that previous one, we're just going to go back to the previous one. We all know that when this is going to, when you come, when you burn something, you're mixing O2 gas and you get CO2 gas coming out. And if it's hot enough, it's definitely water vapor. Uh, you might not know C2H6. So on a problem like this, I'd probably tell you what it is. And it, this is, and words would tell us, it's ethane gas. And by saying ethane gas, you would know gas. So there's going to be times when you're expected to know the phases, but there's other times I provide it. But in general, we have to have those phases with everything on a balanced equation now. Also, the arrow variations. What will that mean is, right up until this point in intro, you pretty much always saw nice little one-way arrows. Well, starting now, you're going to start to see two-way arrows that do mean that it goes backwards as well as it goes forward. Um, those reactions happen a little bit more often than you think. Almost all reactions favor one side or the other, but all, uh, but there are many reactions that actually go both ways relatively easily. So we see both type of arrows. You're also going to see sometimes when we put an arrow and we put the word heat on top of it, really just does mean you have to heat the substance up to get it to go forward. That sometimes means with, you'll just see a delta means the same thing. Delta is change, typically means change of energy. And uh, uh, an odd one here in Florida, we're aware that you put chlorine in your pool. Well, what that does is it makes chlorine free radicals, which go around and, and uh, uh, destroy the uh, bacteria and algae that form in your pool. All right, but to make this reaction go forward, we need to hit it with light. And you will sometimes see it written with the word light there. Or later this semester, we're going to see that HV is the uh, um, two-letter abbreviation to represent a photon of light. It's H and nu. It's a Greek letter representing the frequency of the light. But it turns out to actually turn chlorine into a free radical, it just seems to be hit by light. Fortunately, it's ultraviolet light. So, And if you have a pool that's exposed to sunlight, it's getting plenty of ultraviolet light to make those radicals that go out and destroy the bad stuff that we want to kill on our swimming pools. Okay. We're going to start balancing equation with ionic reactions, and we're going to expand on this because typically when we write ionic uh, uh, reactions early into chemistry, we write what we consider now molecular equations, which show the species all together. Um, so it shows that we'd be mixing a solution of calcium chloride with silver nitrate, and you'd actually get silver chloride to precipitate out, and then calcium nitrate would stay in solution. Well, turns out it's not really the right thing to say when we say it's calcium chloride aqueous, because since it is aqueous, it's dissolved in water, it's actually calcium ions individually floating around. And in the same container, there are chlorine ions, but they're never really together. That's why they're, they're dissolved. When they dissolve, they separate it out. They're surrounded by water molecules. This shows them separated. So anytime you see aqueous and the complete ionic, you're going to separate those things that say aqueous. So that's what we're going to do here. The silver gets separated and the nitrate also gets separated because it says aqueous after that. I'm out of room, so I'm going to put this little arrow and then right below it, I'll do my products. So calcium, aqueous, and nitrate. There's that two, so I need to put a two there. I almost forgot it. Aqueous. But see how the silver chloride has solid? We're going to leave it as a solid and it's going to stay together. All right. That complete ionic shows us some things that aren't doing anything at all. What I mean by that, you notice on the product and reactant side on that equation, you have calcium ions and you have calcium ions that are written exactly the same. You also have the nitrate ion. Technically, they're what we call spectators. They didn't need to be there, and we can't prove they're there from precipitating them out. They float in the solution both times. So net ionics, remove those. In this case, the net ionic would be everything else. Now, weird thing, I could easily remove those twos because it's in every single one of them, and it'd actually be more proper to do that. 
And the other thing that's a little bit more proper, we typically write the metals first. So it would probably be better to have it as Ag ions and chlorine ions forming the AgCl solid. And that would give us our three equations. So we got the molecular equation that shows everything together like it was in the containers. Complete ionics separates anything that's aqueous and net ionic just removes all the spectators. All right, let's do that again. We're gonna do it from words this time. We're gonna take some carbon dioxide and dissolve it in an aqueous solution of sodium hydroxide. All right, sodium is Na plus and hydroxide is OH minus. So aqueous sodium hydroxide and dissolving carbon dioxide in there. And um, it's all right if we say aqueous or um, gas on the CO2, but it does say it's dissolved. So I'm gonna put it as aqueous because that's typically what we say when we say something's dissolved is aqueous. All right, that's our reactants. Those mix to yield aqueous sodium carbonate still Na plus, but carbonate is CO3 two minus. So sodium bi or sodium carbonate is Na2 CO3 and liquid water. And it did say aqueous sodium carbonate, so I'm gonna put that there. All right, we're gonna balance this one, but I'm not necessarily gonna go to from left to right. Since my sodium carbonate is a little bit more complex, I'm gonna try to balance by starting with that. So I have two sodiums, so I'm gonna come over here and do two sodiums. That uh, gives that one carbon, one carbon. I'm skipping all those oxygens for right now. I got two hydrogens and two hydrogens. All right, so right now, one, two, three, four oxygens, one, two, three, four oxygens. It would be balanced like that. All right, that's the molecular equation because it shows everything together. To turn that into a complete ionic, I'm going to separate any ionic compound into its separate little species. So I don't need to do anything with CO2. Even though it's aqueous, it's not really forming ions. It's just dissolved gas. But the sodium hydroxide does get separated. That two gets spread into both those species. And then my product side, I still have the two sodiums but this is now a CO3 two minus, and it's just one of them, and then H2O liquid. Spectators are anything that's aqueous that doesn't change from both sides. And in this case, it's just the sodium. So my um, net ionic is gonna have the CO2 aqueous and the OHs going to form CO3 two minus aqueous plus H2O. Now something similar to this is happening in our oceans right now. So you, you all know that CO2 levels that are high level, well, we don't have to worry about them getting terribly high in the atmosphere because the rain that happens naturally dissolves some of that CO2 and gets it in the water. But unfortunately, it ends up doing this, where um, if you think about this, there is some basic components in water. There's also just regular old neutral components. But whatever it is, it's making it more acidic. And we can actually measure that. Just uh, since we've been actually monitoring things like that, the ocean pH has increased. Um, it's not as well known as the CO2 level because we haven't monitored it nearly as long, but we do see anywhere we've measured it, there is a, 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 an increase in the pH. It's actually gotten more acidic. Okay, classifying reactions. We have a few things that actually apply to stuff we just talked about. The double displacement, double replacement antithesis are all the things we're talking about. And these all mean the same thing. These, are just, these three different terms mean the exact same thing. And all it technically means is you have a cation A and, a, and an anion A, cation and anion, and you have cation B and anion B, and double displacement, you're swapping the metals with each other. Cation A ends up with anion B, and cation B ends up with anion A. They just displace. That's the dis displacement or the replacement. 
All right. Those, no matter how what happens, it happens there. If you have those two ionic compounds you mix, you have a double double displacement, double replacement, or metathesis reaction. Now, if one of these forms a solid, then you have a precipitation reaction because that's what it would look like. It looks like you add two containers of water, and when they mix, a solid forms. And that's actually what that first example would have we gave that would have done. It had the silver chloride in there and would have just precipitated out. All right. To get those precipitation things, we have to understand a few basic ideas of when precipitation occurs. And that's our solubility rules. Now, we will dig deeper into this in Chem 2. In Chem 1, we're just actually looking at the likely candidates to precipitate or not precipitate. Because there's these are kind of the absolute rules. It's either likely it's going to form a solid and precipitate out or not. Now, we actually do kind of learn these in order because the most important rule kind of is in the top because it never gets broken, really. What I mean by that, if you have anything ionic compound that's made with group one ions or ammonium, so anything in group one or ammonium, um, it's always going to be aqueous. So if you see sodium chloride, you know it's always soluble. There is no exception to that. It's always going to dissolve. All right, um, the second rule, all common nitrates, acetates, chlorates, and bicarbonates also are always soluble. So I could actually go with something that's definitely not group one. I'll just go with lead. If I were to put that with nitrate, and most common lead is lead plus two, so I'm going to put lead two nitrate, that would also be aqueous because of this nice little rule that says all nitrates are aqueous. Now, do keep in mind, this says nitrates, not nitrites. With that NO2 minus, it doesn't follow on these exact same rules, so we don't actually apply that. It has to be these four specific polyatomic ions. Same with chlorites, because there's perchlorates, and there's chlorites, and there's hypochlorites. Those don't apply. It's just chlorates. And same here, bicarbonates, exactly. Now, rule three has our first set of exceptions. For the most part, chlorines, bromines, and iodines, like sodium chloride, are always going to be soluble. There are three exceptions, and only three. AgCl, Pb2, or PbCl2, and uh, mercury 2, 2 plus. It's actually mercury 1, but it never forms all by itself. It always has, it's always two of them with a 2 plus. Um, those wouldn't always end up with a solid. So if you actually were to put two of those together, so if I were going to do the, the lead with iodine, it would be PbI2 to get the charge of the lead at positive 2. That is going to have a solid written after it, always. And the next one's an always, too. Turns out almost all sulfates are soluble. The six are your exceptions. And since it is with sulfate, it actually could be safe to say, well, it has to be Ag2SO4, BaSO4, CaSO4. This is a weird one. Hg2SO4, PbSO4, and strontium SO4. It's just those six. Ag and Hg are the only two that need the two in front of them. All the others are nice little one-to-one -one relationships. But any one of those, if you form it in a balanced, uh, in a double displacement or metathesis reaction, you put S next to it. Any other sulfate is going to be soluble, so aqueous. All right, the bottom two are always insoluble, so always going to form a solid no matter what they're with. Now, uh, the weird one is, doesn't override group one. So one tells you that uh, group one ions and ammonium ions are always soluble. So when it comes down here and talks about hydroxides, so OHs, it says they are always insoluble, except when it broke rule one. So while um, barium, or not barium, um, potassium hydroxide is aqueous, if I just go over in the periodic table, from potassium over its calcium, and calcium hydroxide is actually a solid. It precipitates out. The only other exception on these uh, insolubles is actually barium. It's the only one that we'd have to add to group one to break the rule. So it turns out that BaOH2 
should be listed as aqueous. And it is kind of interesting, depending on the textbook, that's somewhere left off because while it's fair to say aqueous, it's not really super soluble. So it doesn't take much to add before it stops dissolving. But we're going to call it aqueous in our, in, because that's what our book refers to it as. All right. The remaining ones down here are always insoluble. Carbonates, chromates, phosphates, sulfides are always insoluble except just what's broken in group one. Now, uh, the sulfides is an interesting one. If you go by uh, the wastewater treatment facility downtown, um, doesn't no, you don't notice the smell as much anymore, but used to when you go by there, it smelled kind of like rotten eggs. Um, it was the smell of sulfur, and that really was coming from there, use, there was once a time when they just dumped the stuff uh, in excess in there because anything that's bad, so all the transition metals, anything that's dangerous would actually form a solid and actually be removed from the water. Biggest reason they don't do that too, too much anymore is because it really wasn't necessary. It was excessive and it did make it smell. And um, since we're in a town that doesn't have a big amount of industry, there's no real expectations for any of the transition metals to be in excess in our water. So why waste the time and effort to remove something that's probably not there in the begin with? And it doesn't make it, it makes it so it doesn't stink so much anymore too. All right, practice. We're actually going to do the whole thing with the molecular equation, the total ionic and the net ionic, but we're going to figure out if it forms a solid by following our rules. So I have potassium iodide, K plus, I minus, so potassium iodide is just Ki. Being that it's potassium, I know it's aqueous. Lead 2 nitrate, so Pb2 plus nitrate is NO3 minus, so lead 2 nitride is Pb. NO3, 2. And nitrates are always aqueous, so I'm going to put aqueous. All right. Our metathesis, double displacement, double replacement, we're swapping our metals. So I'm going to put the potassium with the nitrate. It's still K+, plus, it's still NO3, so it's just going to be KNO3. PB ends up with I. Since I is minus 1, I'll need two of those, so this becomes PBI2. All potassiums and all nitrates are always aqueous. The only one we have to really think a little bit more on here is potassium or lead iodide. And mo while most iodides are soluble, PB2 plus was one of our expe expe exceptions. So this is a solid. Now to balance it, I have these two nitrates. So I need these two potassium nitrates, which give me two potassiums. So I got two potassiums, which gives me two iodines, and that balances this out. All right, our total ionic. We're going to separate the potassium and the iodine, since it had the aqueous there. We're also going to separate the lead and the nitrate. On our product side, we're going to separate that potassium nitrate and we'll leave that together since it does say solid. And then our net ionic where we're going to remove our spectators, our spectators is the potassium and the nitrate. So we'll have our PB aqueous, and those two iodines, I don't know why I put the minus down there, forming PBI2 solid. All right, let's try another one of these. All right, so we're going to mix potassium sulfate. Potassium is K plus, sulfate SO4 2 minus, so potassium sulfate would be K2 SO4. All potassiums are aqueous. Barium nitrate, barium is BA2 plus, nitrate NO3 minus, so barium nitrate is BA NO3 2. Nitrates are aqueous. 
and we're doing our swap. So I'm going to put the potassium with the nitrate to make KNO3, the aqueous. And the barium ends up with sulfate. Now we did have the rule that most sulfates were soluble. But if you back up, barium sulfate was one of our exceptions. So this is BASO4 solid. And on this one, the only thing we have to do to balance it is put a 2 in front of it. All right, and the total ionic, I have our two potassiums and one sulfate and one barium. I dropped my two and two nitrates. Product side, AQ, need to write smaller two potassiums and two nitrates and this stays together since it's solid. That does say S on the end but my page cut off the paper. The potassium and the nitrate are spectators so our total ionic or net ionic is going to be the barium and the sulfate going to form the barium sulfate solid. All right. Along with this type of double displacement, we also have the possibility that one of the things that displaces is an H. And when it's an H plus, we actually call it an acid base equation, along with that double displacement, double replacement. Because see if you, if you see this one, that's acting almost like a metal or the cation, and it's going to be transferred over to here. So this goes down by an H plus, becomes a Cl minus. This gains it. So our displaced thing was that H and kind of the electrons left behind. Because if you think about it, there was a bond between these two. The electrons stayed with the chlorine. The H just went to the other species. But as long as you see that H plus is being moved, we actually can safely call this an acid base equation. Now, interesting ones, talking about acids and bases, the H plus that transfers does need to be transferred into water because it's kind of cu curious that hydrogen chloride is just a gas and it is actually called hydrogen chloride. And it's not really an acid until it gets into the presence of water, but it does actually dissolve in water relatively easily. Matter of fact, if you, uh, if you and me got exposed to hydrogen chloride gas, because we are mostly water, the HCl would dissolve like almost immediately into anything wet. So think about your eyes being very wet. Uh, the hydrogen chloride gas would dissolve very rapidly into your eye and you basically have acid in your eye immediately. But in this picture, we're showing it dissolved into water. And once HCl gas, hydrogen chloride gas is dissolved in water, it becomes hydrochloric acid. And once we formed hydrochloric acid, that actually does a proton exchange. It exchanges that H plus with water to make the H3O pluses and Cl minuses. And that is what gives acid its acidic nature. Those H3Os are the part that makes an acid an acid. There's plenty of ways to create them. There's a lot of different acids. HCl is just one of them. All right. The... HCl is what we consider a strong acid. And um, if we were to compare that to something that's a weak acid, that'd be vinegar. So HCl would be one of these, and it really does this. HCl bumps into water, and every bit of those H's get transferred over to make H3Os. That's why we have this one-way arrow. One-way arrow means that it's an absolute. Every single HCl that dissolves in water disassociates and makes Cl's and H3O pluses. If I were to give that and exchange that to vinegar, which is HC2H3O2, when it bumps into water, only some of it donates to make the H3Os. And then the rest and, and, and makes just a small amount of acetate ions. A large majority of it, or quite a bit of it, stays together as acetic acid, which is why we end up with a two arrow. 
Now we're going to examine that two-way arrow a lot more in Chem 2. Right now, we just need to be aware that there are strong acids and weak acids. The arrow tells us how far it goes into completion. Strong acids are the ones that can do a lot of damage because they do make strong, very dangerous acids. It's not to say weak acids are safe, but they are um, potentially safer, at least from the acid point of view. All right. Our acids that we come in contact with on a day-to-day -day basis, for the most part, are weak acids. And almost all of them are derivatives of carbohydrates, and they have somewhere in the molecule of that uh, particular molecule we're dealing with. We're going to have something that looks kind of like this. I'm going to put my lone pairs on there, and this is just connected to something. And I'll just draw this to say it's something. That is a carboxylic acid. It's a very common organic molecule, very common in your body. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of amino acids. If not, they're the building box of proteins. Every single amino acid has one of those on its, on its end. That's where the acid part comes from. It's very common, but it is always a weak acid. Now, give you an idea of how dangerous weak acids can be. Um, if you feel like uh, uh, being daring, get some uh, lemon juice and just put it in your eye. No, don't do that. It's a bad idea. Uh, obviously, it'll burn, but uh, weak acids can do some damage. Our strong acids are a little bit more um, damaging in equal concentrations. Like all of these are strong acids, and just being one molar, a very low concentration, uh, does give you something that's a very strong pH, very acidic. Um, now, name-wise, we got um, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrobromic acid, hydrochloric acid, hydroiodic acid. So these three get hydro in front of them. So hydro, and then whatever that atom is, change it to an O, chloro, bromo, not O, change it to an ic, chloric. Chloric acid. This would be hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid. These down here are uh, oxo acids. So we look at the polyatomic ion and see that this one is nitrate. So this becomes nitric acid. Uh, sulfate. Sulfuric acid. Let me fix that. And it's not ClO3, which would be chlorate. It's one more, so per chloric acid. And I guess I do have enough rhyme here. I am going to write these out. Hydroiodic acid and hydrobromic acid. Now these guys over here are weak acids. Almost anything else that we put with H, any of our, our uh, uh, non-metals with H, so HF, um, H2S, those are going to be weak acids at best. Now that's not to say they're safe. Like uh, you want to see something very um, interesting, check out hydrofluoric acid on, um, on the internet because it's something you can buy yet it does make some for some interesting burns. Um, it actually causes the skin to look kind of like you were in the bathtub too long and how you get all pruney. It's just a little bit more permanent. It won't actually go away when your skin dries back out. I think you have to have skin grafts to get it removed. But probably that would be the most minor thing that could happen to you because it turns out the fluorine and that hydrofluoric acid can penetrate through your membranes into your skin way too much and remember how we had some insoluble solids? Turns out calcium fluoride is insoluble enough in your blood that even a small amount of that fluorine that gets into your bloodstream can screw up the calcium cycle. And even in contact with a small amount of hydrofluoric acid can cause someone to go into cardiac arrest just because there's not enough calcium in the blood. So weak acids aren't safe by any stretch of the mean. They're just not acidic. Uh, but... For the most part, anytime you're dealing with anything chemical-wise, especially in a chemistry lab, you'd actually get to know your chemicals before you touch them. So wouldn't just go let anybody go mess with the hydrofluoric acid. All right. Strong bases actually are a heck of a lot easier to figure out. If we back up to our solubility rules, we know that pretty much 
the only hydroxides that are soluble are group 1s. Therefore, anything in group 1 that forms a hydroxide is a strong base. All the rest of the weak bases are either slightly soluble hydroxides or they somewhere have an NH3 or just a nitrogen with three things attached to it. Turns out any nitrogen with three things attached to it actually can behave like a weak base. Backing up to that uh, uh, amino acids we were talking about before, we did say they are partially weak acids. Well, they're also that amine, it's like ammonia, that actually means that somewhere in that molecule, amino acid, there is a nitrogen species. So they are basic and acidic at the same exact time. All right. Ammonia is a very common one. Matter of fact, uh, the guy who figured out how to mass produce this, um, Haber, was considered a hero because of it, even though he also created a lot of nasty uh, chemical weapons that were used in wartime. So he has the um, bit of a dubious background because he created something that without that extra ammonia, um, our population of the earth would only be about half what it is right now because the rest of us would starve otherwise. So ammonia is actually kind of critical to um, getting the fertilizer to the amount we need. All right, next type of classification reaction is a true neutralization reaction. It's definitely an acid-base reaction, but a neutralization reaction has one common product always. You always get one of the products to be water. Now, um, the nice thing about having water as a product, we can kind of say it happens like this. You have an acid, you have a base, you're gonna make a salt and water. Now it's not sodium chloride, it's an ionic salt. So you're making an ionic compound and water. Now your acid and base, the acid must have some extra H's. The base must have some form of OH's. It's H pluses and OH's which is where the water is going to come from. Matter of fact, back when I was in high school, back in the dark ages, we could never write water this way. We had to write it as HOH because that stressed where it came from. Isn't that weird? We actually had to call it hydrogen hydroxide. All right, next type of reaction we're looking at is a redox equation. Now, every single thing we've looked at so far could be a redox equation, but doesn't have to be because uh, the only thing that's necessary in a redox equation is we need to show electrons transfer. Now the easiest way to see that electrons are transferring is if we see something like this. I have sodium where it's all by itself and suddenly it's part of a molecule. Well, the only way the sodium is actually gonna actually become part of sodium chloride is if it loses an electron and becomes an Na+, which is what we're drawing down here. Same with the chlorine. The only way it's going to be part of this is if it somehow becomes negative. So it must gain electrons. So that gain and loss of electrons is what we see in redox equations. Now you don't always see it drawn out like this because there's no electrons in this overall process, yet that's what's really happening. Uh, the half reactions are done typically just to show us that there's electrons. They're not necessary to balance the equation, but they typically show us where the electrons go. All right, terminology-wise, and what's going on here is some pretty interesting stuff. So this is an ongoing process here. So we have, and you can tell that uh, is a copper wire. But as soon as it's down in the liquid, you see it's got like a dark buildup on it. And then over here, it's clearly gotten darker, but the water or the liquid has turned green. All right, well, turns out something cool is going on. This copper solid here, is actually turning into copper ions. Now, this solution will turn blue in a bit because that's that's just the nature of this species. That green is just a temporary little transition, but as it finishes up and forms copper 2 plus, it forms a brilliant blue color. Uh, but the buildup on there, that brownish black stuff, that is another metal forming on the surface of it because it turns out this solution Turns out it must have been silver uh, something, but it had some silver ions in there. Because what we're seeing build up on that, that blackish stuff that's starting to turn into this, this dark stuff, at least in this picture, is actually solid silver. Would be a neat little effect. You're seeing the solution turn blue. You're seeing some silver form as a solid. And it's not supered rapidly, but we are seeing it happen um, in a short amount of time. Even in a lab setting, 
15 minutes, you'd be able to see this. So you wouldn't be able to watch it, but you could definitely tell it happens. Now, to technically to get this all complete, we couldn't have just put silver ions in there. Technically, that was probably silver nitrate. So I'm going to actually rewrite that with silver nitrate. And then those nitrates stick together and we make copper nitrate. Have to put the two there to balance out those charges. And then to balance this out, I've got these two nitrates. So I need two of these, which would give me two of these. Give us our balanced equation. Now, this is not proper to call this a double displacement reaction because we're swapping one metal for another, but one metal was all by itself. Since it is all by itself, we actually call this single displacement or single replacement. That is the only difference. If one of species is all by itself, so a nice little silo like this, it's just single displacement. All right, back to some terminologies in our oxidation re reduction. We're going to go back to that sodium chloride because it's a little bit simpler reaction to look at. So this was the overall process of Na and Cl2 giving us NaCl2 or NaCl. You need to have two of those to balance out the chlorines and two of these. All right, that, was, that overall process is a redox equation, and we know that because we have a molecule all by itself and then it's not. All right, when we split that into two half reactions... And we're going to see how to do this. We're going to see that electrons are produced on one equation, used up on the other. The equation that produces electrons is oxidation. Oxidation is a loss of electrons. Oxidation loss, meaning we're making them. Reduction is a gain. So reduction is gaining electrons. All right, and since these two have to go together, the species that's being oxidized is the reducing agent. So even though this reaction shows oxidation, this guy here is specifically the reducing agent. And this is the opposite. Since this is reduction, this guy here is the oxidizing agent. So when up here in this top equation, we could say this is the oxidizing agent and this is the reducing agent. I can clean that up. That looks like I can't make an R. All right, now there is other ways to do this. We're going to actually figure out how to do it differently in just a second. All right, so we're going to go out of order here. Rather than actually just try to look at here and tell what the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent is, we're just going to go right to figuring out our half reactions down here. So to do the half reactions, we're going to imagine this gets split into two species, like an ionic compound. So this is H, H pluses and Cl minuses. So I'm going to actually take my H2 there and write H plus. And the other half reaction is going to be the Cl2 making the Cl minus. And I just grab those species from that reaction up at the top of the page. Now I'm going to add things to balance it out. First thing I'm going to do is since this has H2, I'm going to put two right there. Since this is Cl2, I'm going to put a two right there. Now the only thing I necessarily need to do is add the electrons and what I'm going to do is I want the charges from both sides of the reaction be the same. So right now there's no charge on this H2, but on this side there's a positive charge. And there's two of them. So I got a grand total of two positives here, two positives here, and nothing here. The side that's higher in charge, I'm going to add electrons to it to reduce that to the same number. So I got two positives and those two negatives make zero. And then here, nothing charge-wise, negative 2 here. So my more positive side, which is this side, I add electrons to. All right, now that we have our half reactions, and we see that this first one, the H2 going to pr produces H, produces the electrons, this must be the oxidation. So the reducing agent is H2 and gains electrons. So this is being reduced. Therefore, this must be the oxidizing agent. All right. Now, kind of an easier way to do this, um, and in many cases, or in many cases, it's easier, but not always. 
So we're going to learn more than one way to do this, is to actually identify these things and what their oxidizing numbers are. All, right, all an oxidation number is, is telling you how many electrons it owns to a degree. All right, for instance, um, or how many it owns that it's not supposed to. When hydrogen is with itself, each of those hydrogens owns all the electrons they're supposed to. So hydrogen all by itself has an oxidation number of zero. Same with chlorine. Matter of fact, anything that's all by itself has an oxidation number of zero. On our product size, we have something that's kind of like an ionic compound. And anytime H is with a nonmetal, any nonmetal, that H has a positive one oxidation number because that kind of acts like it's a positive one ion. And the negative or the anion just has the ionic charge it would have, negative one. All right, and now we can actually answer the exact same things we did here. The oxidizing agent is the species that's being reduced. And if you look here, the chlorine's oxidation number is being reduced. It goes from zero to negative one. It's being reduced, therefore it's the oxidizing agent. The hydrogen goes from zero to positive one. It's gaining, therefore it must be oxidized and therefore it's the reducing agent. All right, that second way involves using oxidation numbers. Now, these can be actually easy to figure out in many cases, but not always, because we don't have rules for every single atom on the periodic table. But there's certain ones to look for. Like, for instance, if you have an atom that's all by itself, either elemental, like the metals when they're by themselves, or any of our diatomics, it's going to have an oxidation number of zero. If it's an ion, the oxidation number is the ionic charge. So if that had to be Na plus instead of Na, that would have a positive one formal charge or ionic charge or, sorry, it would have a positive one oxidation number. Now three deals when there's more than one atom. So if there's H2O, since H2O is a neutral um, molecule, we know that the oxidation number of the H's and the O's adds up to zero. We don't necessarily know what either one of those values are, but we know if, let's say this is still that positive one, like we said, if it's positive one, that O must be negative two for it to add up to zero. And if it's a polyatomic ion like CO3, since the CO3 has an ionic charge of two minus, we know that the carbon and three oxygens if we sum up their oxidation numbers, they must be two minus as well. All right, to figure out those two, the H2O and the CO3, we need to set some rules. So the first rule that is always gonna apply is hydrogen. Turns out it's positive one when it's combined with a nonmetal. That means this is positive one. It's not negative one if it's combined with metals. Turns out there is species like NaH. And when it's NaH, that H has a negative one oxidation number. Therefore, this sodium must be positive one. All right, the oxygen is the next rule. Now we could kind of figure out what it must be here with H2O for it to be an ox uh, overall oxidation number of zero. Those two positives would have to be canceled out with a negative two for an oxygen. And turns out almost all the time we see oxygens, they are negative two. The exceptions are when we're dealing with peroxides. Peroxides are gonna be called that way. And since we just call this carbonate, those are just regular oxygens. Each one of those has a oxidation number of negative two. Now, you'll notice there's no rule for carbon here to figure out carbonate. We actually do solve it by default. So we have those three oxygens that would give us a negative six. We want the overall charge to be negative two, so each one of the, that carbon would have to be positive four. And we will see that carbon has more than one charge state possible, which is why there isn't really a rule. Matter of fact, if you notice how oxygens can be negative two, negative one, and even 0.5s, negative 0.5s. Well, we also have another weird exception. Turns out, O, F, two, that oxygen is actually positive because the fluorine is a negative one, and that oxygen is actually positive two. It's the only atom that oxygen can bond with 
where it's going to have a positive oxidation number. And that introduces rule three. Turns out fluorine, unless it's by itself, is going to be negative one. Halogens pretty much do that um, unless they're bound to other halogens. What I mean by other, uh, turns out if F is bound to Cl, F gets to be a negative one, that Cl gets to be a positive one. But if Cl is bonded to bromine, since Cl is higher on the periodic table, physically higher as in above it, it gets the negative one, then bromine is the positive one. So the one that's at the top of the periodic table gets that negative one charge. All right, we don't really do a lot with the formal charges or the oxidation numbers. It's a nice little tool to help us to identify some things. We are going to practice on this. Turns out the sulfurs on all, all, all three of these molecules have a different oxidation number. All right, so to figure out that first one, I know H's. Uh, when they're with nonmetals, have a positive one formal charge. To get that that balance out, that sulfur needs to be a negative two. All right, next one, SO3 two minus, sulfite. Oxygens, it's not soft peroxide or anything, it's just sulfite. Those are negative twos. There are three of them, bring that up to negative six. We want this to say negative two, so this sulfur is positive four. All right. Same thing happens on the sodium sulfate with the oxygens. Those must be negative two. The sodiums are same as sodium plus ones. So those actually both have a positive one formal charge. So we got two of those, got these four negatives. So Four times two is negative eight. Brings this, these two brings it up to negative six. Therefore, this sulfur needs to be positive six. In your worksheet, I got several of these to practice with so you can get comfortable figuring out your oxidation numbers. All right, um, we did that equation. I know I have it there. Let's actually try to balance an equation uh, that's a redox equation, the old traditional way. All right, so to balance this, we first need to come up with our equation. It says it's just the combustion of ethylene. C2H4, combustion just does mean we're going to mix it with oxygen, and out comes carbon dioxide and water. Now, I do know it's a redox equation or a reduction oxidation reaction because I get oxygen all by itself, and then it's not. So it must be. I don't need to figure out what oxidation species are or reducing species, at least not yet. Let's just see if we can balance it the old style. So I got two carbons, two carbon dioxides, four hydrogens, two waters, two times two, so four oxygens, five, six, three oxygens. It's balanced. Let's go back here, put gas there, gas there, gas there, gas there. This equation's done. Turns out balancing most redox equations are going to follow the exact same rules we did before. Where it gets tricky is when we do things like this. This is also a redox equation, but it's only showing you the species that are being oxidized and reduced. And I'm not even bothering to tell you which one's being oxidized or reduced. I just show that the Cr2O7 2 minus turns into Cr3 three positives. At the same time, iron 2 plus turns into iron 3 plus. Now, I know it's a redox because the only way this is going to happen, charge states go from a 2 plus to a 3 plus, is if there's an electron exchange. So it must be a redox equation. But I didn't give you enough to actually balance the equation, like because I got this oxygen just disappearing. All right. To balance these, we have a few simple steps we're always going to do. First thing we're always going to do is to split it into two half reactions. So what I mean by that, we're going to take that dichromate and have it react to form chromium and take that Fe and have it react to form the Fe3+. We're going to balance these separately. And even though there's oxygens there that don't go anywhere, we will have a method to get rid of them. All right, first thing we're going to do, see how this got two chromiums here? I'm going to start by doubling that. 
I don't have to do anything here. Irons are fine. All right. But now we're going to take care of those extra oxygens. Now, what happens here is it's going to help to understand that being that these are ions, these are all happening in aqueous solutions. They just didn't say that, but that's the only way this could have happened. And since it's aqueous, we know there's water. So we're just going to assume that those seven oxygens went into water somehow. I didn't have to do that with the iron because there was no oxygen, but I did have to do that here. That took care of the oxygens, but it did do something weird. Now we have the problem with there's too much H's. Well, I can't add more waters here. That won't fix my problem. But something else that happens in aqueous solution, there are some H pluses floating around in there. And that must be where these H's go. And there's seven times two. There are 14 H pluses being created. All right, by adding waters and H pluses, we'll be able to balance out our atoms in the molecules. Now, that doesn't mean these half reactions are balanced because one of the last things we have to do in any half reaction is make sure the charges, the ionic charges on both sides are the same. Now, we're gonna start over here because it's easy to see what's going on here. I've got a two positives, got three positives here. The three pluses is bigger. So I'm gonna add one electron here to bring that down. Those would add up to two, that's just two. Now it's balanced. This one's a little bit trickier. I got 14 positives. Those two minuses bring this whole thing up to 12 positives. Over here, got nothing. And those three positives times two, so six positives. This side here is larger in charge. So I'm gonna add six electrons to this side to get those charges the same. I can get rid of my math numbers. All right, those are our two half reactions. They have all the atoms balanced by adding oxygens with water and hydrogens with eight for the H plus or H pluses to balance out the hydrogens. And then we added electrons to balance the charges. But when to balance it together, when we combine these two equations, we want to combine them in such a way that the electrons go away. I got six electrons here. So I'm going to take everything in this equation and multiply it by six. So I would technically end up with something that looks like this, that dichromate and those 14 H pluses and th six Fe two pluses form two chromates, seven waters, and six Fe three pluses. And there it is balanced. All right, we're going to do a couple more of these just so we can actually go through the steps. Next one, though, doesn't appear like we have to do those steps. Doesn't it appear right now that it's balanced? Yeah, I got one chromium on, one, on each side. You got one iron on one side. It looks balanced. The reason it's not is because the charges aren't actually balanced. So the proper way to do this is to turn it into your two half reactions and then figure out where we need to add our electrons. What I mean by that, this side's more positive. I need to add three electrons to it. So it actually is the same charge on both sides. Two positives and three positives. I need to add an electron here. All right, now notice how the electrons aren't balanced. To truly balance this equation, it should have been written as Cr3 plus plus three Fe two pluses. Give us that Cr and three Fe three pluses. Got to have those charges balanced for a redox equation to be balanced. All right, going to do another one. I actually went out of my way to make this one challenging by adding all those oxygens to it. So we have to actually add waters and H pluses. All right. That looks like a capital M and it's not supposed to be. MnO2 going to MN2 pluses. Just so I don't run out of space, we're going to do these separately. I don't have to actually add any coefficients to the for the MN, but I do have two oxygens, so I'm going to add two waters. 
that created four H pluses. So I'm going to add four H pluses here. Got four positives on this side, just two over here. So I'm adding two electrons here. So this first one's half the reaction is MnO2 plus four H pluses plus two electrons form Mn2 plus plus two waters. All right, on the other side, nickel hydroxide forming nickel oxide. All right, nickels are fine, two oxygens, two oxygens, we're fine, have these two H's, I'm going to add two H pluses. No charge here, just these positive two, so just have to add two electrons here. All right, so the two electrons are going to counterbalance each other. I don't have to multiply either equation by two, so I'm just going to have the MnO2 and the four H pluses from this first reaction, and then the nickel hydroxide forming the Mn2 plus and two waters and two H pluses. And then technically, these two H pluses and these four H pluses counterbalance. Those all go away. And this would go down to just two. And then it would be balanced. But same steps, balance out your, your ions, the metal ions themselves, add waters to balance out your oxygens, add H pluses to balance out your H's, and then add electrons to balance your charge. All right, once we have a balanced equation, we can do some interesting math with it. When we have a chemical reaction, what's going to relate atom A to atom B is that balanced equation and its moles. So I could compare moles of reactant A to moles of reactant B or product A, but as long as I have a balanced equation, I have what we call a stoichiometric factor. And I can take this a step further. Might not actually measure out moles. More than likely, we won't. More than likely, it's going to be something like maybe mass. So if I have the mass of the hydroxide, of magnesium hydroxide, convert that to moles, and then knew a chemical reaction that related magnesium hydroxide to sodium hydroxide, I'd have a stoichiometric factor. All right, we're going to apply that with this. So this is that type of reaction I just had. We have some sodium hydroxide, and we're going to use it along with this magnesium chloride to make some magnesium hydroxide. And we want to know, well, how much sodium hydroxide would we have to have to make 16 grams of magnesium hydroxide? So we're kind of working backwards. I gave you the 16 grams, so that's what we're starting with. So 16 grams of magnesium hydroxide. And we want to turn that into moles. So one mole of Mg hydroxide. And I'm going to get that from calculator. So I'm going to do 16 times 2 for those two oxygens plus 2 times 1.008 for the two hydrogens plus magnesium is 24.31. So magnesium hydroxide has a formula, molecular weight, molecular mass of 58.33 grams. Now, the ratio, I want to find the relationship between the magnesium hydroxide and the sodium hydroxide. Now, at least on the test, I'll tell you if I have a balanced equation. Um, and like this one, it does say unbalanced. So first thing I need to do is actually make sure I have a balanced equation. So I have these two hydroxides, so I need to have two sodium hydroxides. That gives me two sodiums. So I need two sodium chlorides. It gives me two chlorines, two chlorines. So 
these coefficients in the balanced equation become the stoichiometric ratio. I just move them down. Two NaOHs, one MgOHs. And then it wants to know the mass of sodium hydroxide. So one mole of NaOH, molecular weight of NaOH is, let's see, O is 16, H is 1.008, and Na is 22.99. Forty point zero zero. So how much mass of sodium hydroxide would I need? We can do that relatively easy now. I'm gonna put it over here, I'll move my calculator in a second. So sixteen divided by fifty-eight point three three times two times forty. And there was nothing there. So this is going to get, need 22 grams, roughly, of NaOH. Now, if you're thinking a little bit deeper, it takes more than just NaOH. We'd also have some MgCl needs as well, because you kind of have to have both to get this to go forward. But you do need at least 22 grams of NaOH, or else you wouldn't be able to make that many grams of magnesium hydroxide, because the OH is coming from the sodium hydroxide. All right, so we have a couple ways that we've done this already. This just adds uh, a, a, another relationship to it. So we already saw that you could take the density of a substance to get the mass. And then um, the mass can go to moles. We have the volume going to moles through molarity, and we have the number of particles going to moles with Avogadro's number. We've got a bunch of ways we could relate these now. So uh, the type of problems we can have that are similar to set up to this one get vast because there's plenty of ways we can go to get moles. But no matter what, if I give you an equation like this, that should be step one. Convert whatever I gave you to moles, and then you can use the stoichiometric ratio to go to another species. All right. Turns out that previous problem introduced a common uh, problem we have, reactant limits. So what I mean by reacting limits, I'm going to back up a couple slides. So I said we needed that 22 grams of sodium hydroxide. However, if I didn't give us any magnesium chloride, we wouldn't be making any magnesium hydroxide because we wouldn't have had any magnesium. To make the magnesium hydroxide, you would need the hydroxide from the sodium hydroxide and the magnesium from magnesium chloride. One of those will run out first in the process. So if I had 22 grams and 22 grams, that might be enough to make 16. But no matter what, one of those two reagents we'd run out of first. Those are what they talk about limiting reactants. Now, a little bit easier way to see this, and I like how your book does this, very common, traditional way. How about this? If I give you 28 pieces of bread and 11 slices of cheese, how many sandwiches can you make if it's just two pieces of bread and a slice of cheese for a sandwich? Very plain cheese sandwich. But we all know that'd be just 11 because you'd run out of cheese, after you've used up 11 slices of cheese and 22 slices of bread. So you'd make 11 sandwiches and you'd have six pieces of bread left over. And there's nothing you can do to these pieces of bread to get cheese into them without getting more cheese. So your limiting reagent is the cheese. All right, so how do we do this in something like this problem? Well, we're going to see a different one. So uh, not that, that's pictures. How about this? I'm going to give you two grams of silicon and one gram of, ni of nitrogen and ask you in this equation which of them is limiting. Now, we do this in introductory chemistry, and, and you might have even done it in high school chemistry. I know I did, or at least they tell me I did. I don't remember high school chemistry. You typically did something weird where you'd take those two grams of silicon and you do the one and a half grams of nitrogen. And you'd go through all the stuff and you'd get, figure out something they'd both make and figure out which one makes the least. And that would be your limiting reagent. Well, we don't nearly need to do that. What we're going to do is just start with this two grams of silicon, find out if, that, if there's enough nitrogen. So we're going to relate these two reactants to each other. All right, so what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to convert that gram of silicon into a mole of silicon using the molecular formula of silicon, which is... 
29 point, or no, is it 29 or 28? It's 28.09. And I'm going to rate, relate the silicon to the nitrogen and then convert that nitrogen into grams. All right, so that two grams of silicon then is going to need two divided by 28.09 times two divided by three times 28.02. So to use up every bit of those two grams of silicon, we would need 1.33 grams of nitrogen. All right, but we have 1.5 grams. We have extra nitrogen. Therefore, silicon is the limiting reagent. Now, had we done that math, and this came out to be a larger number than nitrogen, then we'd know that we'd run out of nitrogen first. But since this was smaller, we'd run out of silicon first. Silicon's the limiting reagent. All right. Next weird thing, the terminology that pops up, is something that always creates problems when we get to chemistry lab. Percent yields. The reason percent yields are interesting is because everybody tries to get these percent yields as high as they possibly can. All right, so I'm going to show you something that's interesting that uh, organic chemists have to deal with in industry. All right, this molecule that I'm drawing right here is propane active ingredient that we use to actually barbecue. And we're going to actually show the chemical reaction where we take that, react it with chlorine, and we put a chlorine on one of these and make, a, we rip off one of these H's and put it with one of the chlorines and put this chlorine where the H was. All right. There are two different ways, two different places we could put it. We could put the chlorine on the end and make a CH3, CH2, CH2Cl, or we make a CH3 and put the Cl in the middle, CHCl, CH3. Now, it doesn't matter if it's at this end, because that's really the same as this one, just a mirror. So there's six end hydrogens. The chlorine goes on one of those ends or one of the two middle ones. All right, yields-wise, this always happens about 33% of the time. This one happens around 66% of the time, even though it seems like it'd be less because there's only two of those hydrants that create that one. It actually turns out it's more stable, which is why it happens a little bit faster. All right, but 66 and 33, 66 is your best yield. So all of a sudden, we're telling you that, and everybody likes to try to replace, uh, equate this to grades. What I really am saying is the best grade you can get on this test is a 66%, which stinks, right? All right, but that's the truth. That's the factor. And think about it. If you're the or if you're the uh, chemical engineer and you have to make this stuff, there's no way to really shift that yield. So you're going to make 66% of your stuff is going to the garbage because you didn't need to make it where the chlorine on the middle. All right, so percent yields are all over the place. So don't assume they have to be high. They are what they are. Chemical engineer's job is to get it as high as possible but that is, some cases, no better than 30%. You just got to get it as, up to that 30% the cheapest way possible in some cases. All right, we're going to see how we can actually determine this and get these, 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 these percentages. But it really is just a simple thing of we're doing a calculation on how much we could make and compare that to how much we actually did make. We're going to see that with this nice little example. So I'm taking some copper sulfate and doing a reaction with zinc to make copper and zinc sulfate. But we're getting the copper sulfate from, who knows, you can buy it at, at the, uh, uh, and, um, 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 garden centers of most good retail stores because it can be used as a, 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 a um, aid in your fertilizer type stuff and whatnot. Also, you see it sometimes in like uh, um, fish tanks. All right, but we have it all over the place. So how pure it is tells you how much it should be to do. All right, so what we're going to do is we are going to take 
and assume this is 100% ultra pure copper sulfate. 1.274 grams of pure 100% copper sulfate. What we're going to do is figure out how much copper it could make. So I need to figure out how much a mole copper sulfate weighs. So I get out the periodic table and I see that, uh, and I'm going to go with my four oxygens first, so four times 16. Plus, the sulfur is 32.06, and the copper is 63.55, and I get a molecular weight of 159.61. And my balance equation, and it is balanced, shows that every one copper sulfate, you get one copper and one mole of copper is 63.55 grams. All right, so let's see, what's the most copper I could make if that's 100% pure copper sulfate? So 1.274 divided by 159.61 times one divided by one times 63.55. The most I can make is 0 0.507 grams. Actually, I can go four significant figures. 0 0.5073. All right, but I didn't do that. I only got 0 0.392. So to figure out a percent yield, we're going to take that 0 0.392 and divide it by that number we just got and then turn that into percent. We only have three significant figures because of this. And I clicked on that before I read my number. So we have 77.3%. Now remember, that's not a grade. At least not a grade that you live with. That's a grade of how pure your copper sulfate is. Your goal is to get as much copper out as possible. But if there's like impurities in there, if it's a natural source, there's other things in there, that might be a reasonably good number. Depends on how cheap your sample of copper sulfate was. But that's what you do. You actually live with those percents. All right, last thing we introduce in this chapter is a wonderful thing called titration. Now, titration is a mole-to-mole -mole conversion, but it's done in solutions. Now, reason this comes in handy, it turns out when I buy HCl, hydrochloric acid, I typically buy the most concentrated stuff possible, and it's right around 12.1 molar. So very dangerous stuff, and then we dilute it down to what we want to use. Well, dilution's done by just adding water. Well... That 12.1 molar is close to accurate, but there's plenty of reasons why it might vary some. So it's not a very exact thing by adding water to it. So if I wanted to get 6 molar, I really am cutting that concentration in half. So take in 50 milliliters and dilute it to 100. But I'm just going to get close on those volumes because I know the 12.1 is just close. If I want to know the exact concentration of my HCl, I compare it to something I can get much more exact. Sodium hydroxide is a good example because I can actually get sodium hydroxide far more accurate because it turns out sodium hydroxide can be bought as a solid. And since it's bought as a solid, I can actually measure out a mass to the exact gram and dissolve it into a volume that I know exactly. So obtaining a 0.2501 molar concentration of sodium hydroxide is far easier than obtaining a 6.00 solution of HCl just by the nature. So here's what we do. We get this sodium hydroxide very accurately known and then we do a neutralization with HCl. So we actually do just take this HCl that we were trying to figure out its molarity to it. We actually add it to the NaOH until all the acid and base neutralize and um, goes away. And we use little indicators to see this, a neat little thing that we can see. But mathematically or calculation wise it becomes kind of neat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these two numbers to get my moles of NaOH. So I'm actually going to write it as 0 0.03523 liters. And then I'm going to turn this into 0 0.2501 moles of NaOH per liter. Because that's what that means. And by multiplying those, we'd have our moles of NaOH. Now, we only care about the HCl. 
So using this balance equation, we're going to write down a relationship between NaOH and HCl. Nice little one-to-one -one in this case because nice little one-to-one -one in the reaction. This would now give us our moles of HCl. And to get moles of HCl into molarity of HCl, we would just divide it by its volume in liters. And the original sample is just those 50 milliliters, so 0 0.05. Zero, zero, zero liters. So, calculator wise, we take that volume of HCl, or volume of NaOH, 3523, multiply it by its molarity, 0 0.2501, multiply it by its stoichiometric ratio, just one to one here, and then divide by its volume. 0 0.05000. Zero, zero, zero. I get four significant figures now, so my molarity of that HCl is 0.1762. Molarity. And that gets us done with this chapter.